All right, for the final piece of information that we're going to cover, I'm going to be talking about conditioning. And in the memory video, I mentioned that conditioning, both classical and operant conditioning, are both forms of non-declarative memory. That means that these are things that are outside of our conscious control. So classical conditioning, which I'm about to talk about now, occurs without us even being aware of it, and it's also really not something that we can control in any way. Um, and I'll give you a couple different examples of, of conditioning in our everyday lives. But to start out, we really can't talk about conditioning without talking about Pavlov, and so that's why we're looking at some bells and some dogs. Probably you are already a little bit familiar with the story, even if you hadn't done the reading, which I'm sure you have. Um, so Pavlov was a physiology researcher who's really interested in digestion, and he had um, actually a little, what was known as a cannula, a little tube that was connected to the dog so he could measure how much saliva the dog was making. And not surprisingly, whenever he would give the dog food, I can't find my cursor here, whenever he would give the dog food, the dog would salivate. And this is known as an unconditioned stimulus um, and an unconditioned response. So an unconditioned stimulus is something like food, that is going to trigger a response no matter who you are, no matter your culture, your age, it's going to trigger a response. Um, other things that might be considered unconditioned stimuli would be um, seeing somebody who you find sexually attractive. That's going to trigger a response. Uh, getting pinched hard in the arm. That's going to trigger a response. Um, seeing a large animal growling and showing its teeth at you that's going to trigger a response. All of these things, you don't have to learn anything at all. There's no conditioning necessary. It triggers a response. Okay. Now, um, I want to compare that to what is known as just a neutral stimulus, like a bell. Um, a bell, unless it's being rung really loudly, isn't going to trigger any kind of response in us. And so initially, the bell had no value at all to the dog. But what Pavlov was doing is every time he would go in or one of his research assistants would go in to give the dogs food, they would ring a little bell to let everybody know they were going into the lab room. And in this way, the bell was a reliable predictor that the dog was about to get food. And if any of you have pets, I think you know that dogs are very good, as are we, at seeing what kinds of environmental events predict food or what kind of environmental events predict that we're about to see our boyfriend, girlfriend, uh, partner, husband, wife, uh, we're very good at making these associations. And so because the bell was a reliable predictor of the food, it took on meaning through the process of conditioning. Until eventually the bell becomes what Pavlov called a conditioned stimulus. It has taken on meaning because of conditioning. And so now, the condition stimulus of the bell will trigger salivation. Um, and certainly that's not something that used to happen. It used to be that the bell didn't do anything. But now, as I've said before, the bell has taken on meaning. So I want you to just think about on your own time, how does the conditioned stimulus and the unconditioned stimulus differ? And hopefully that will become clear on the next slides. Um, and another thing is the conditioned response. What is its purpose? So why does the dog salivate to the bell? All right, so um, I'm gonna go ahead and advance to the next slide here and kind of answer some of these questions and talk a little bit more about the process. All right, so this is my little diagram for uh, classical conditioning. Typically what happens is you have some kind of stimulus that initially starts out as, as neutral but because it reliably predicts something else that, that always has value, that conditioned stimulus is going to start to trigger a conditioned response. All right, let me give you an example now. All right, so now I want to talk about one of my favorite examples in my own home, and that is the fact that my dogs love cheese. Um, and so, uh, unfortunately, whenever we are going to have some cheese, you know, we're grating cheese for ourselves, and oh my goodness, if we grate over the floor, some pieces of cheese happen to fall for the dogs. 
Now, if you are a dog or any sane-minded person without a lactose intolerance, cheese is going to make you happy. All right, we don't have to learn anything about that. Um, cheese is an unconditioned stimulus that will trigger a response in anybody. No learning is necessary. Now, the learning comes in because the dog needs to learn how to predict when the cheese is going to arrive. All right, so in our house, it is the sound of a particular drawer in our refrigerator where we keep the cheese. And I swear to you, um, whenever they now hear that drawer opening, they come running. All right, so that sound of that drawer opening reliably predicts the cheese. All right, so that's, in order to have a conditioned stimulus, it needs to be something in the environment that is a reliable predictor of something else that's important to, to the animal. Now, what ends up happening is the dog will exhibit a conditioned response. This is a response that they have learned. And essentially the whole point of that conditioned response is to allow them to prepare for the cheese. All right, so they come running just like these little cuties right here um, in order to prepare themselves to get some cheese. All right, uh, so that's the dog example. I'm gonna give you another example that maybe has a little bit more personal relevance. All right, so here is my second example. Now I realize that this is a very old fashioned uh, phone, but probably um, most of you text, maybe all of you. I'm, uh, I'm kind of in 2002 in terms of my technology. I don't really text, um, but I've heard about it. And I would imagine that now if you get your text alert, you know, a little sound that lets you know there's a text message or you see an icon a little bit like this, you probably get pretty happy. And that is actually a reflection of classical conditioning. So if you showed um, you know, somebody who doesn't text at all this picture right here, um, it really doesn't have any meaning to them at all. So a text alert starts out as a neutral stimulus, but because it is something that reliably predicts being able to be in contact with a friend, then that text alert takes on meaning. And so we would say it is a conditioned stimulus. All right, so the text alert, when you hear it or see it, you probably have this overwhelming urge to exhibit some kind of response. In particular, checking the message. You probably also feel a certain amount of excitement or curiosity. Um, and so you will check the message as a way to prepare yourself for contact with your friend. Uh, we could probably also put that the text alert is going to cause you some happiness or if you know that it's a text message from somebody you don't like, text alert is going to give you some anxiety. Um, but again, that is something that requires learning um, because if we show this to somebody, as I said before, who has no experience at all with texting, that little icon or the little sound, you know, boo -doo 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 -doo, isn't really going to have any meaning to them at all. All right, let's uh, move on to one final example. All right, if you've ever had a glaucoma test at the eye doctor, um, hopefully you will be familiar with what I'm about to talk to you uh, right now. Um, and this is actually something that's known as eye blink conditioning. It's one of the classic ways that classical conditioning is uh, studied in humans. So with a glaucoma test, typically what happens is you put your chin on this uh, rest right here, and then this machine shoots a nice little puff of air into your eye. Now, I don't care who you are, how old you are, where you come from, a puff of air in your eye is going to cause some blinking. Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't really cause too much else. It certainly doesn't cause pain or it shouldn't. Um, but that's an automatic response that does not have to be learned. However, what you might see if you have done this for a little while uh, that the machine itself starts to take on value. You know, if you've never had a glaucoma test before, you see this machine right here and it doesn't do anything to you at all. But if you had know this machine and that this machine reliably predicts that you're going to get an air puff in your eye, well then having to put your chin on the chin rest is probably going to trigger a response. And so commonly having your chin on the chin rest is going to cause you to blink, it's going to cause some anxiety, and this allows you to prepare your body for the fact that it's about to get a puff in the eye. And one of the best ways to prevent that puff of air is for you to blink. 
Um, and so in this case, the conditioned response and the unconditioned response are pretty similar, but they don't have to be. It's something I want you to keep in mind. All right, let's go ahead and advance to the next slide. Really briefly, I want you to bear in mind that there are two uh, key things that really need to happen in order for classical conditioning to actually occur. In order for that CS to take on meaning, you've heard me say it many, many times already, that condition stimulus, you know, the sound of that cheese drawer opening, needs to be something that reliably predicts that the animal is about to get the unconditioned stimulus. So there needs to be consistency. The CS needs to be consistent in its ability to predict the US. The other thing that needs to happen is there needs to be closeness in time. If I opened up that cheese drawer and then three hours later grated cheese, well, then the sound of that cheese drawer really doesn't have much meaning to the dog. So the CS, the sound of that cheese drawer, needs to occur just shortly before US. It needs to occur before because it needs to predict that the US is about to happen. So if it occurs afterwards, it's meaningless. You know, if I give my dogs cheese, they don't really care what happens after that. They only care what is a predictor for the cheese about to drop on the floor. All right, now I have a little stop and check for you. Um, go ahead and stop the video and quiz yourself with these three examples right here. I want you to go through and for each one identify what is the unconditioned stimulus that, that triggers a response no matter who you are. What is the conditioned stimulus that reliably predicts the unconditioned stimulus? And then also what is the conditioned response that helps the body to prepare for the unconditioned stimulus? And I think they kind of go in uh, Baby Jeff is the easiest one, Sheba is a little bit harder, and then Gina is perhaps the hardest one. All right, and then once you have your answers, you can go ahead and continue the video, and then I'll give the answers a little bit later on. All right, I did want to speak briefly about some of the ways that classical conditioning um, can be applied in real life. Uh, definitely there are a huge number of examples of classical conditioning. I've given you um, two in human life, one in, in dog life. Uh, but we see that advertisers use classical conditioning quite a bit uh, because they want to give their product a little bit of meaning. So for example, if we look at perfume or cologne, that's a really hard thing to advertise. So one of the things that advertisers will do is they will pair their scent, which would be the condition stimulus, with something that probably automatically, no matter who you are, is going to trigger some kind of response. So this would be the unconditioned stimulus, an attractive couple in love and kind of a sexual, sensual pose. Um, and so that allows these scents, these um, images right here, to take on meaning. And we can look at something different right here. Uh, Diesel wants to pair their cologne with this guy. Um, so he looks like a pretty man's man, a, a tough guy, probably somebody that a number of men would want to emulate. And so by allowing uh, these two to be paired together, the cologne is going to take on meaning because it being paired that way. And I think we see that in a lot of advertisements, Gatorade being paired with Michael Jordan, beer being paired with uh, an attractive woman to make beer even more pleasant perhaps than, than some people already find it. Um, a deodorant being paired with this strong, sexy woman right here gives it um, a little bit more value. We also see that classical conditioning plays a very important role in substance abuse. For example, if we look at smoking and drinking, now this is one case where I can't say definitively one is the CS, one is the US. Um, cigarette smoke might be uh, the predictor of alcohol, the smell and taste of alcohol might be the predictor of, of cigarette smoke, so they're both kind of the CS and the US. But what we see is that when one is present, it will often trigger a craving for the other. Um, and probably, actually I know the data on this, that um, when smoking was outlawed in bars, we see that people have an easier time of quitting because it takes away one of those cues. And so classical conditioning is responsible for, <clears throat> in many cases, the sorts of cravings that people will experience. So I also have a guy here who is uh, shooting up heroin. Um, heroin is something that has a number of reliable predictors. Uh, people tend to shoot up with the same people in the same place. They tend to have the same uh, drug ritual. And each of those things are reliable predictors for the fact that the heroin's about to come into their body. 
And so uh, what ends up happening is when this guy right here sees one of his drug buddies, that's going to elicit a craving for him. Uh, when he goes into the place where he usually shoots up, that's going to elicit a craving for him. So one of the things that can be really valuable for people who are trying to quit substance use is to change their environment, to leave their environment and try and get away from all of those conditioned cues because that actually does reduce their level of craving. All right, moving on, I do have the answers here to those little stop and check questions I gave you earlier. Um, hopefully you did actually do the exercise um, and hopefully you had more or less uh, the same answers that I have here. Now, that does it for classical conditioning. Uh, we're at 15 minutes here, so I'm going to go ahead and stop and create a new video um, for operant conditioning.